So just how old is Iceland and what evidence could we bring to bear to answer that question? In my previous video, we just talked about the total volume of magma, right? The total volume of, of volcanic deposits that are the island of Iceland. And we noted that the island of Iceland is like the size of Wyoming. Um, but then when you consider what's underneath the sea and extend it out, it ends up being about 200,000 cubic kilometers of basalt. And the gist of that previous video, which there's the a young Iceland, meh, all right, it's not a young island because you do some basic calculations like we did in that particular video. And what we find is, is that um, the amount of time it would take to generate that much magma, right? The amount of time it would take to generate that much volcanic material presents some serious problems to those who wish to believe that the world is only less than 6,000 years old, or in this case, less than 4,500 years ago. Because a global flood that covered the world apparently didn't cover Iceland because it didn't leave any sedimentary deposits, at least the sediments that you would expect from a global flood. So therefore, the island of Iceland must have a post-flood origin. So how do you get all that volcanism in there? Huge amount of heat, huge amount of sulfur production, right? All of these are huge, enormous obstacles to developing a paradigm in which Iceland fits within, in a natural sense, into a young age universe. But I had promised at the end of that video that I was going to show one more piece of data, something a little bit different. I'm going to address it from a different angle that I think ups the ante even higher, makes the challenge even greater for young earth creationists to explain the origins of the island of Iceland. Oh, before we get started, I just, I just need to note that what you've been watching is the current Reykjavik Peninsula eruption that's going on near the town of Grindavik. And uh, this is just from a few days ago. Uh, this is a video by Born Steinbeck. Uh, a little short clip, this is only a 15 second um, clip that I took uh, from his publicly released video. But you should go watch his other videos. Incredible drone imagery of the current eruption. All right, but let's get to it. Let's find out what that next final piece of evidence is that just begs for an explanation. We got that coming up next. Okay, here we are. This is just one publication of multiple publications I could go to that discuss uh, fossils on Iceland. Yes, there are fossils on Iceland. In this case, we're going to look at uh, plant fossils. There are some animal fossils on Iceland as well. Uh, which raised the same challenges I'm going to raise here, but the plant fossils are so much prettier to look at. So I'm going to use this particular paper um, from the review of paleobotany and paleontology. Uh, paleontology is the study basically of spores and of, uh, well, spores and pollen grains uh, to reconstruct past environments. So our paper is Middle Miocene Floras of Iceland Floras Plant of Iceland, the early colonization of an island. The question is, is this some of the earliest flora that used to be on Iceland? And yes, there was a lot of flora, as you're going to see in a moment. A lot of different types of plants have lived on Iceland in the past, and we have them preserved in a fossil record. And you might be thinking, hey, the whole island of Iceland is just like all volcanic material. How do you preserve plant material or animal material in volcanic rock? Well, it's not so easy to, to preserve it in straight up lava flows. But there's also pyroclastic flows, all right, heated ash uh, and liquid sometimes mixed together. And then there is also ash falls, which are actually a great preservative. Um, and we have some of our best fossils found around the world have been preserved for us in ash fall layers. And it's no different on Iceland. In fact, there is sedimentary rock on Iceland that, that is derived from the breakdown of volcanic material, because there's erosion going on there. There's a lot of water in Iceland, it's flowing from the glaciers, eroding volcanic material, and then laying it out in uh, basically flood valleys. Uh, and so there's opportunities for fossilization in those places as well. So our authors, Grimson, Dank, and Simmerlson uh, from Iceland and Sweden, 
have brought us in 2007 this particular description of a middle Miocene flora. Now there are other floras, meaning there's other time slices from Iceland's history which also have recorded floras. Uh, so we're just going to go back pretty far to 15 million years and 13.5 million years. Now, of course, I'm making this video because we're, we're kind of discussing the challenge this is to young Earth creationists. Young Earth creationists believe that this is less than 6,000 years old. So, of course, they don't believe the 15 million year old dates. But the important thing is, is that um, we're going to see that these floras are buried underneath multiple layers of volcanic material. So it must represent some time in the past, you know, not just yesterday, not just last year, not just the last thousand years, but these are old mountains that are eroded today. And we're seeing underneath that material, there are floras present between uh, volcanic material, all right? So not flood deposits in terms of a global flood deposit, which would have kicked up all kinds of you know, mud and other kinds of quartz and all kinds of like sand and materials that are not materials that are produced by, um, by uh, volcanism. All right, so they've looked at two macrofloras. I mean, macroflora would be uh, large enough pieces of plants that you can see the parts, right? Versus microfloras, which are paleontological, right? That are, that's the spores and the, uh, um, and the pollen grains. But they actually, in this paper, do look at those just briefly as well and mention that, yes, there are the same kinds of spores and pollen in the same layers with the macrofossils that represent the same types of plants, right? There's uh, basswoods and there's oaks, right? And there's, um, there's maples, right? And, and those then have also have spores, or, sorry, pollen grain in this case that are associated with those particular fossils. Right. Again, not something you expect from a global catastrophe mixing everything up. Right. This is a consistent macroflora with an associated microflora, all compacted into uh, various layers found in the Iceland rocks. Uh, they're described from the oldest exposed plant-bearing sediments on Iceland. So they're saying these are, the, these are the oldest layers, sedimentary layers, for which we have plant material. There are other layers of rock that are much older than this, they haven't found plant material uh, in those. Um, all right, so we don't need to read the abstract. I'm just going to show you a couple pictures. This is not going to take me a long time. I just want to. I just want to go through the. the I just want to get the main point across here and show you some pretty pictures. Uh, so here we have a diagram of Iceland showing uh, where these fossils are found, and you won't be surprised to find out they're near the edges of the island, all right, where, um, where um, runoff from material from the island uh, is going to occur, but also erosions occurring, because we have to have had laid down material, right, first, creating the layers that have inside of them plant material, and then we had to have erosion at some point later. Um, so we have some time in the past, probably a long time ago, right? You had buildup of layers. And then in the more recent past, we've had erosion allowing us to see now and be able to document uh, these different fossils. So it's just showing the, the locations where they're, they're typically found. So they found, uh, let me see, Fagus, which is uh, beech trees. They found Aeschylus, which is the one around a blanket right now, and that's the state plant of the state that I'm in right now. Um, chestnut trees, um, and let's see, magnolias, um, and tilia, which is uh, basswood. And then there was already other plants, other species that have been found uh, in there, including metasequoia and sequoia trees. All right, so that's quite a, quite a variety of uh, tree types. They also have picea, which is spruce, right, sequoias, betula, which is uh, birch trees. Uh, there's magnolias, all right? So that's just so that's just a good idea. Like this isn't just like one kind of tree that's found there. There's like a variety of trees, you know. So there's a whole forest full of multiple different types of trees living there at the same time. So now we get down to a couple profiles, right? So um, going from ocean level at zero because we're that we're out near the 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 sea where we're seeing these. Uh, where we're seeing the rocks being exposed, right, from the erosion from the sea moving in. Uh, and so up to, in this case, 100 meters, so like 300 meters up. And here we have another location from zero to 
you know, 25, you know, feet up. And we have, what do we have here? Lignite, right? Basically a type of coal compacted uh, organic material. So carbonation, you know, carbon-based stuff right here, you know, thick layers of that on top of which is sandstone and below which there is some sandstone. So these are sedimentary layers. These would have been uh, like a, a valley floor, uh, someplace where you have uh, sediments being deposited. But below that, we've got theolitic lava and above it, you've got theolitic lava. So what, we re what this represents is you got you have thick layers of volcanic material. Then you have some period of erosion from somewhere else depositing material on top of that. And then you have more, you know, mag uh, you have more volcanic material laid on top of that. And that goes over you know, over here in this 100 meter column, right? Hundreds of feet high. Uh, you have thick section of sandstone. Then you have it followed by, again, lava. Then you have more sandstone. Then you have lava. Then you have another layer of sandstone, right? This would represent a series of events, right? God, this doesn't all just happen at one time. This doesn't all happen in just a couple months. This is likely thousands and thousands of years in order to have these different, uh, uh, produce these different types of lavas. And it's not all the same type of volcanic material. Some of it's volcanic ash, some of it's pyroclastic flows, some of it is uh, lava, right, uh, that, has, that has poured out on the ground. So that represents different volcanic systems in the area at different times experiencing different kinds of eruptions with spaces in between allowing for erosion and breakdown of the surface of that, uh, that material, allowing deposition on top. So just to give you an idea of what uh, some of that looks like, this is what they're, you know, what they're pointing, what he's standing here for is, you see these two black lines running parallel to these layers of sediments. These are uh, hardened sandstones. Uh, and in between those layers are these dark bands. Those dark bands are high carbon content. Uh, and so this would be surface areas that had grown up with a lot of, you know, there was a lot of plant material at that time. By the way, this could also be um, small you know, glacial lakes as well. And so you have sediment filling these lakes, and eventually you have then maybe plant material coming in there, uh, settling down to the bottom of the lake, then you have more you know, other sediments uh, laying on top of that, laying on top of that, and so forth. So you can get stacks of that type of thing in lakes. But eventually, what's above it, actually, I think in the description, it talks about there being you know, another 50 feet of just basalt on top of that, right? So whatever happened here to lay these sediments down, it was at a later time you had the salt laid down. And all of this is highly eroded. And these are all in locations. Um, let me go back up to this map. It's worth pointing out because it also emphasizes something about the history of Iceland. Um, most of these locations where you see these this plant material um, is at the edges of Iceland, but it's also in regions that are have no volcanic activity today and haven't for a very long time. There's no historical records of volcanic material, uh, volcanic action. In those. Right now, the current volcanic action is happening in um, the Reykjanes Peninsula. So come down here, see, see all this out here? Right, this is all extremely old stuff that is eroding. It's like the old, one of the oldest parts of Iceland because the Reykjanes Peninsula, I can't say that word, is highly active. And so there's new deposition here and there are historical records of volcanic um, activity all over the place here. There's volcanic activity up through here, down through here, all the way around here, and then up through here. That's the main volcanoes, sort of a belt, because that's the continental, you know, that's the, that's the mid-Atlantic ridge right there where the active sites are. So the farther you move away from this ridge, the less active you have. So this is very inactive up here. Uh, and then this region out here, no activity. It's all worn down, eroded material. And so when these uh, plants lived was a long time ago, they were covered up by mountains of additional um, volcanic material. And then they've just been eroding ever since, and now we're seeing them uh, exposed at the surface. All right, hey, we gotta look at some fossils. All right, so here's another, uh, they're showing different locations. So here's a location where you have some sandstone, you've got uh, one, you know, olivine theolitic lava, you know, versus porphyritic lava. So these are 
different lava flows. And each one of those might actually be multiple stacked lava flows from maybe the same volcano, but maybe spaced apart every year, or maybe every 10 years, maybe every 100 years. A lot of volcanoes in, in uh, other parts of Iceland, you know, they're active for maybe a few years. And then it's like 400 years later, they'll be active for a little, little bit again and lay more layers of the same kind of lava down the same place because they still have sort of the same source chamber of material that's being laid out on the surface. Um, and over here we have, here's a nice thick layer, uh, almost, what, almost 10 meters, almost 30 feet, 30, I can't speak tonight, 30 feet thick of sandstone, siltstones, conglomerates, right? So this is, this is a river channel or, or, a, or a, um, a, a flat um, a washout uh, area, in my terms today. Uh, and then also right in there is some more lignite. Right, so an especially thick layer of plant material. All right, so let's get to some of the plants. Right, here we have uh, the cupressaceae. Um, those are uh, yews, so that's a uh, uh, form of gymnosperm, right? Not a flowering plant uh, family. Um, these are not particularly dramatic, so I'm just going to scroll on by them. Uh, here we have sequoia. All right, sequoia, like you know, a close relative of redwoods uh, and meta sequoias, the dawn redwood. All right, there's more of them. You can see the incredible detail here. There's stomata. All right, that's an, those are individual two individual cells that make the little opening to allow uh, carbon dioxide to escape and for oxygen to sorry for both. That's terrible, zabatnus. The oxygen to escape from the plant and the carbon dioxide to enter into the plant through the stomata. Um, and so this would have been, this potentially is preservation actually in volcanic ash, uh, where you get very, very uh, good detail at times. All right, so now we're getting down to some of the flowering plant families. So we have preservation there, and here we have um, beech trees coming up. Yeah, so those are nice looking beech leaves. Beautiful preservation. And these are all in black sands, right? So it's, it's I, I should have said that before. I mean, this is a type of sandstone, um, but this is broken down volcanic material into small small enough pieces to be able to call it sandstone, right? It has that, that density. Uh, and so these, these plants are being preserved in that black sand. And so that's why you're getting these, uh, what, that's why they look the way that they do. Uh, here's some flowering parts, all right, different uh, fruits. Keep on going, I'm going to keep on going. We're going to we're gonna get to the good stuff in a minute. Um, uh, just going to keep on going. There's a figure at the bottom that we're, we're going to spend a little bit of time on. But I just wanted to show you some of the pictures. Um, this was magnolia. This one here is magnolia. And what's this one? I can't remember. Platinus, all right? Platinus is a sycamore, right? And not the same sycamore that uh, we have here in North America today. It's a different species, but identifiable as sycama, uh, sycamore tree. Mm, this looks like another tilia, maybe? Um, oh, Aeschylus. All right, so this, is, uh, this would be the chestnut tree. Right, there are chestnuts that have a single leaflet versus the palmate chestnuts, which we have around here, uh, which are the five leafed, uh, five leaflets. Maybe this is tilia. Sorry, I gotta go up here. Um, oh, caria, which I can't remember the common name for. All right, it's different species, different genus, in fact. Here's some more. Um, and then we've got more Aeschylus, right? So there we have some nice branched veins. Beautiful stuff. There's a couple comments in here about some of the insect damage on some of these as well. So you can see that, uh, that there were insects in Iceland in the past. Even more, that's Tilia, so that's basswood another common North American tree in temperate forest. That's the thing, a lot of these are temperate trees too. These aren't like 
super far north, Tyaga type trees, all right? There are there's, there's a few spruces, um, but it's not like there's spruce and fir dominating. This is more temperate forest, so this would have been suggestive of a time when it was much warmer. Bunch more. I think those are fruits. Okay, so what they're recreating here is like, you know, at different elevations, um, you would have had different types of trees, which is the same as today. You've got forests that you have individual trees that live in, in particular habitats, uh, floodplains versus the rivers and lakes versus alluvial plains versus hillsides that are better drained. Um, and so you get this large paleo environment, right? You get a whole bunch of different flora all living together there. Uh, and many of these were based on the leaf size and some of the other uh, roots that have been found suggestive of very large trees. So this is a very, very different time in Iceland than, uh, than its current climate, despite the climate being a little bit warmer now than it has been in a long time. And so historical records, we know that there were more trees in the past, most have been cut down, but there wasn't extensive forest and certainly not these types of trees uh, present uh, any time in, in recorded history. All right, so now, now let's get down to like, how did they get there? That's what we're really here for. How did they get there? And when was this? When was this? Well, I already said that the dating is that this, you know, there's two major floors, one at 13.5 million and then one at 15 million. So 1.5 million years in between in which there's not much record of flora. So they're suggesting maybe there was changes in climate such that there was a flora disappeared and then there's another floor and there's actually differences in the distribution and the types of plants in those two different flora suggesting different environments uh let's just lump them all together and just say like the challenge is hey there's lots of plants and they were there a long time ago um where did iceland come from again you've got iceland which is on the mid-atlantic ridge and so the, Vulcan, the volcanism runs right through the middle of Iceland and actually curls around here. This image isn't really showing that very well. And then as it's separating, it's pushing out the, you know, it's pushing, well, it's pushing Europe away from Greenland. And so Iceland is becoming more and more isolated over time as it pushes out. Uh, but that implies that if you were to go back I don't know if you were to go back, uh, what is this, 15 million years right here, you'd be taking out this big section, this big wedge here. All of that material that has pushed out, pushed Greenland and ice, uh, like Greenland and Europe away from each other would have been that much closer together. So therefore, Iceland would have been not that far from Greenland, and Iceland would have been a whole lot closer to like the Faroe Islands. And then you'll see that why is this white region? running through here. Why not the stripes, which represent the layers of, of rock, right? Um, down, they represent the uh, oceanic crust. Why aren't they showing the oceanic crust there? That's because there's a huge ridge. And I showed that in the last video, how Iceland is sitting up on a huge pedestal, right? 2,000 meters, right? Well, actually, I think it was 2,000 feet above the bottom of the ocean. And this pedestal is basically out here. Remember I said Iceland's actually like this big. Like if you just, you know, if the oceans all went down like just four or five, 400 feet or so, Iceland would suddenly double in its size. There's a massive amount of volcanic material sitting above the uh, floor of the ocean. And so all of this represents magma that's sitting on top of the, uh, the basement um, part, well, actually on top of the oceanic crust. And Greenland, the same way, right? Greenland has a continental shelf or shelf off the island. And here's the, here's the cool thing. This shelf basically runs this higher area of material, right? Sitting thousands of feet above the oceanic crust actually connects to Iceland and Iceland connects over here, the Faroe Islands. And then everything over here is shallow. I mean, you know, like this whole area used to be above sea level when during the ice age. Um, and that's the key. That's the key to how Iceland has had some animals in the past that would have gotten there before humans. And also how a lot of the flora probably got there because this whole thing would have been connected by a land bridge at some time in the past. 
or if not a completely connected land bridge, certainly many, many, many islands, right? Large spits of land sticking out, and maybe they didn't quite have a connection most of the time, but they might have been so close together that it would make it easy for, trans, uh, for transfer of materials, especially on birds, of plants from one piece of land to another piece of land. All right, so all of this suggests that Iceland in the past has been more connected to the other two continents as it has continued to grow itself into a larger island. Uh, and so how do young Earth creationists explain this, right? How do they explain that? Oh, I should have been on this one. Um, they're saying if you go back 55 million years ago, when you're talking about continental drift, well, 55 million years ago, you got Greenland here and you have the UK, right? And actually the Faroe Islands here, and they're pretty close together. And you know that European flora and the North American flora are not that different, you know, across this region, right? Northern Europe and Northern North America. Uh, suggesting interchange in the past, well, here's your point of interchange. Uh, and then as the plates separated, all right, as the ridge continued to pump out more magma and separate the continents, there was this continual ridge they're suggesting. Um, between the two. And eventually, a portion of that ridge ended up producing so much material because there's kind of a hot spot right there. And as that hot spot continued to grow, the ridge formed, right? And it got pulled apart, but it just continued to come up. And eventually, you have Iceland above the sea surface. In fact, you have Iceland above the sea for surface as to the tune of four or 5,000 feet above in many places of Iceland. There's huge mountains in Iceland. And so as it was connected, um, it got flora from both Europe and from uh, North America. Eventually, though, it gets separated, and there's, a, there's water that's continuously separating the two. I mean, the water's too deep that even during the last ice age, they wouldn't have been connected, right? So young creationists try to use uh, land bridges for the global ice age that they think happened after the biblical flood, like 400 years afterwards. So, so that puts it around just 4,000 years ago. And then that's how things moved around, how animals moved around. This would not, Iceland would not have been connected at that point, right? If they believed that Greenland and Europe were as far away as they are now. Um, so where did Iceland come from? We suggested that Iceland had to have been a, um, a, a completely post-flood produced thing. And many young Earth creationists today support this idea of catastrophic plate tectonics, how at near the end of the flood, suddenly the plates started separated and the Continents separated really, really fast, like on the tune of like, you know, tens of miles a day or something. I mean, it's just like uh, a really super speed motion, and so the the ocean uh, floor is being produced really, really quickly. And so I think they would say, well, there was a hot spot, and like extra amounts of magma came up there and produced Iceland. Well, the last video was about like how that's a little hard to take. I mean, because of just the amount, right? the heat that that would have generated, the gases that would have generated. Um, now what I'm adding to this in terms of the challenge is, if there were plants there, um, not at the very beginning, but not long after the, the island formed, and it was these continents were closer together, uh, this really isn't a scenario that young earth creationists can work with because there's not really going to be that interchange. Uh, and these plants all seem to have come and come in and lived on volcanic material. So it wasn't just like leftover material from the flood and there was like bits of plant material and seeds or something like that and they sprouted on Iceland. No, Iceland had to, Iceland had to form a hundred, at least a hundred cubic kilometers of volcanic material in order to even come out uh, above the surface. And then once it came out above the surface, it still had to produce another 50, thousand cubic kilometers of volcanic material in order to make the island that's there today. If that's all happening within the space of five years, 10 years, 100 years, I'll even give them like 400 years before the uh, ice age. In 400 years, the entire island is just a, a quaking mass of volcanoes, right? There's, there's not going to be massive amounts of, of, of plant material. There's not going to be a forest on Iceland enough that you can compress it into coal, little coal layers. 
right? So that's just, you, you can't have that at that time. Like, where are you going to, where are you going to put these plants? How did they get there? And why, how did they get there when they got there? That's the challenge to the younger creationist model. Because as I said before, most of this plant material has more volcanic material stacked on top of it. So it, it isn't really recent. It had to be from the past. Um, maybe they want to say that, um, you know, the climate was much, much warmer right after the flood. And, and that's actually in their mind what caused the ice age because there was so much water in the air and then it all fell out. And, you know, and that's what created the ice caps that were on Iceland too. But the thing is, Iceland's undergone multiple ice ages as well. Um, and it's, you got to squeeze those in as well. <laughs> so, um, but okay, yes, it could have been much warmer in the past, but you only have like a 200 year window and you have to grow an entire, you know, entire forest. And these are multiple layers of forests, you know, multiple layers of, of sediments that have, um, plant material in them. Ah. Uh, I just, you know, I was just talking about another paper that uh, mentioned, you know, the term stretching credulity. And that's the way I feel about this. You know, there's just too many events and way too little time when you're talking about having to squeeze in all of this history into the Young Earth Creationist framework. All right. So, um, yeah, this is just something that when I, you know, as I've been watching stuff happening on Iceland, you know, I got really, you know, I started thinking, like, how do I explain that? How do I explain, how, how, what's the explanation for these volcanoes um, and the expectation? Because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what Icelanders are certainly concerned about is like, what's going to happen? Is, uh, is Reykjavik, uh, Reykjavik in danger, right, uh, of being obliterated by volcanoes? Well, if you trust the old age um, calculations, you can go in and you can uh, determine for different volcanic systems. And there's lots of volcanic systems in Iceland. Lots of volcanic systems. Even on the Reykjavik Peninsula, there's considered to be at least five different major rifts. And each one of those rifts then is a separate volcanic system. Um, and so one of them will be, you know, maybe one, one of them is going off right now, right? And the other ones have been dormant, and many have been dormant for well over a thousand years. Uh, and they can see, like, they can look at different layers of basalts and they can date them. And they can figure out that, uh, hey, this particular volcanic system is going to have, you know, it's going to build up enough, you know, the, the, the land is cracked enough, enough magma will have come up that you're going to have uh, the ability to produce some magma on the surface, like, once every 600 years. And this other system is like maybe once every 1,500 years. And another one's like once every uh, 1,000 years. And the amount of magma it's going to produce is like, you know, you know, a small hill over here or part of a mountain over there or, you know, fill up this little valley over here. It's not like any of those historical records suggest that like an entire, like, like this whole thing, like this whole Reykjavik Peninsula was all produced in 1,000 years. No. There's been little pieces and bits that have been formed. And during that entire time, I lost my feed for that. So, but I'm almost done. And, you know, during that entire time uh, that the Reykjavik Peninsula has been experiencing different eruptions, um, the city there is actually just outside of those rift zones, fortunately. Uh, so it had to be a very significant event to actually affect that particular city. I mean, it's possible. Uh, but then you consider like the upper part of uh, Iceland has never experienced any activity in historical records. And then when you go and look at the radiometric dating of the, the, the lava flows there, you'll find out that they are on the order of a million or three million or five million or 15 million. Uh, and some of the oldest rock on Iceland is like 25 million years old. Right? You might think, well, why not 55 million years old? Because, you know, the continents were separating already at 55. Well, you still have to you have to build up two thousand feet of volcanic material before you can come out on the surface, and we're only seeing what's like above the surface uh, to be able to date that. I suppose you could go in and do cores, and there I would expect you'd find older and older and older and older uh, magmas, right? Um, so the, the the idea is that for young Earth creationists, they have to believe that every one of these volcanic systems, of which there's 
like a hundred different like individual sort of fault lines and different separate separate uh, volcanic channels, all right, that are leading to the surface. All of them would have to be active all at once, essentially, and they would all have to be pouring forth as much magma, it, more so than there is from any one of them today, all at the same time, and they'd have to all be doing it for hundreds and hundreds of years to even come close to making a fraction of the total volume of Iceland. Right, which is going to make the whole place completely inhabitable. Today, you've got like a 700 year break. You know, a lot can happen in 700 years. I mean, the town of Grindavik is, you know, came into existence and has been around for a long time. And now it is in danger of being obliterated, right? Covered over by, by um, magma in the not too near future. That's a real possibility. Um, but all the other towns in Iceland, that's not going to happen to them. Maybe it happen to them someday. Right? The frequency of volcanic eruption is not so high as to be a significant disruption uh, or danger to all the people of Iceland. But that can't have been the case in the past if you're going to squeeze all of Iceland into 4,000 years. Honestly, if you're going to have the entire island produced just 4,000 years ago, it would still be like really hot and the entire thing would be still solidifying because of the amount of volume there and the, if you do the calculation of like how long it would take to dissipate that heat. So that alone is a problem. So maybe like the paper I just read yesterday, that the other recording I did last night, which I haven't released yet, um, was talking about how did marsupials get to Ice, Iceland? <laughs> no marsupials in Iceland. How did marsupials get to Australia? And this paper suggests, a young earth creationist suggests, look, none of the explanations for how you would migrate there make any sense. They just don't. They don't, the calculations don't work out. It's too improbable. Therefore, God made it happen. God directed the marsupials there. I would say just, just say that God like teleported them there. Um, that would solve all the problems. Um, you're going to have to have the same explanation here. Iceland had to just have been like made by God after the flood. Like at least like 90% of it, like, okay, we're just going to make 90% of it instantaneously or speed up natural processes somehow or extract the heat. I mean, this all goes back to the heat problem, right? The famous heat problem that is one of the biggest issues for young earth creationists in terms of flood geology is Iceland is just one tiny fraction of the total amount of volcanic material that has been deposited on this earth that would be during the flood or after the flood. And you do the calculations of how much heat is contained in all that rock if it was magma at one point. And basically, you know, you're going to melt down the earth, right? The surface of the earth. Uh, and then you have the gas problem that comes along with it. And you have uh, there's a myriad of other issues. And so one of the solutions to that is basically you have to invoke miracles. You just have to invoke miracles in terms of releasing, the, you know, getting rid of that heat. God just had to have planned for that uh, and withdrew the heat somehow. So Iceland's going to be, I think, kind of the same way. You got to just say, God, God did it. He just made Iceland. Um, but that is typically not what young earth creationists want to say, and I, for understandable reasons. God's creation was done in six days, and since then, he's not, in their minds, drastically interrupted the world in terms of mir miracles, which is why they try to explain the entire global flood within the framework of naturalistic interpretations, right? A naturalistic reason for how the floodwaters broke forth and how the plates might have moved around, right? They do all their calculations based on actual like statistics and knowledge of the present day processes. They're not putting miracles into that until you absolutely need them because there's no other explanation. All right, yeah, that's my that's my Iceland story, right? Cool, Iceland fossils. I didn't know about them until I looked them up. In fact, I did a, I did a Google search. I'm like, I'm thinking about Iceland and I'm, I already had thought about the volcanoes and looked up the total volume of uh, volcanic material and something about heat and I, you know, I had worked up some of those numbers and then I was like, just on a long shot, are there any fossils in Iceland? You know, like where and where are they? And like, how old are those fossils? And I was really surprised to find out there's 15 million year old fossils in Iceland. 
and quite a few of them, right? A lot of fossils on Iceland. Uh, not nearly as many as we find on most other continents, but unless a whole lot more than the none that I was kind of expecting. Um, and I, I, I shouldn't have been surprised. I mean, even, even Hawaii has some fossils too, and it's all volcanic in origin as well. All right, hey, thanks for hanging out with me. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, like, subscribe, do all those good things. I have no idea what I'll do next. You know, I've got my incredibly long list of things that I would like to talk about, and it's kind of like whatever piques my interest uh, tomorrow. You know, I might see something and be like, oh, I was thinking about that, and that's an interesting twist on that, and that's what I'll do. Uh, because I don't, have a, I don't have a strong agenda here. The agenda is just how I feel that day and whether I am motivated to make a video. And honestly, sometimes I'm not very motivated. <laughs> sometimes I can't get into a groove. You know how many times I've started to make a video uh, and I'm like 10 minutes into it. I'm just like, nah, that's it. I'm done. Can't speak today. Just not, words aren't coming to me. Don't feel excited about this. It isn't what I dreamt or thought it was going to be when it was in my head because I haven't written the script and it's just like, I, yeah, I thought I could talk about it, but then realized, nope, I can't talk about this topic. Um, you know, halfway through this video I was kind of feeling that way, but you know, I pushed through and hopefully I'll edit out some of those parts that I felt like I was stumbling over my words. Uh, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Signing off. Bye-bye.